Amboss, a Lightning Network Explorer, has just released a product called Liner or Lightning Network Rate. Could this serve as the basis for the risk-free rate of Bitcoin, forming the foundation for Bitcoin capital markets and indeed an entire Bitcoin financial system? Today, we break it all down and discuss. Let's jump in. So I will admit I am a bit of a finance nerd. I studied finance back in undergrad. And so this definitely caught my eye. And a lot of what folks like Nick Baccia, the author of Layered Money, have talked about for some time have been things I've found fascinating. And so with the release of this index, which we will talk about in a lot more detail today, I thought it was fitting to do a video on this collection of topics because it is of massive importance if hyper-Bitcoinization is the ultimate goal. Robust capital markets, i.e. markets in which suppliers and borrowers of capital can come together are absolutely critical for any sort of reserve currency or form of money. And if you think about it, a capital market sort of necessarily follows the human tendency to want things sooner, right? If there's $100 or you know half a Bitcoin, whatever it is, I would prefer to have that money today as opposed to say a year from now. And the difference in how I value that same monetary amount at those two different points in time uh, is often called something like a discount rate or the time value of money. It's ultimately reflecting this idea of time preference, which folks like Seyfedin have written about extensively. And so modern capital markets really follow human nature in that sense. And so it begs the question of like, how do we start conceptualizing this in a Bitcoin world? And as far as I'm aware, Nick Batia is the person who was first talking about this. He was talking about this back in 2018 with this piece, The Time Value of Bitcoin. Definitely an interesting read. And Nick was just way ahead of the curve then. It's pretty funny that he's only recently gained, you know, a lot of traction and popularity in the community when he's been writing about these concepts for a very long time. And then really the big one that we'll reference and that I would urge you to take a read of fully. Again, this is April 18th, 2019. That's just crazy. He's writing about the time value of Bitcoin and what he calls the Lightning Network reference rate. Uh, but he's been on a number of different podcasts and he talks about this concept of money as being necessarily layered. And this is consistent with what we've seen historically. And he goes through the analogy of like, hey, gold, you know, you literally unearth gold nuggets from the ground. That's your like base level. And the protocol that that needs to adhere to is that it is element number 79 on the periodic table, right? Like it either is gold or it is not. Then you can go one level up and you say, well, you know, the minters and smelters can kind of take those gold nuggets and form them into some standardized set of coins or what have you. Then you might have that gold being stored in bank vaults. And so the bank is issuing certificates that can be redeemed for gold and so on and so forth, right? And so each of these layers serves a specific role. And the farther you get away from that base layer, you're basically leaving the kind of final settlement and security behind, but you're making it more practical to conduct economic trade. And so Nick makes the argument that Bitcoin is no different, right? You have the base Bitcoin protocol, which is about censorship resistance. It's about digital scarcity and enforcing that scarcity through a distributed consensus. But it's really a second layer like the Lightning Network that is going to take that next step and make Bitcoin the asset much more accommodated for economic activity. And so going back to the earlier concept, again, any sort of monetary system needs to have this concept of the time value of money. Or another way to say that is interest rates should generally be positive. And so in our modern world of even negative interest rates, you know that something is very, very broken. But you need some way to measure and quantify the time value of money, which allows for intelligent capital allocation. I might be a saver that has no need for my money currently, but there might be a borrower out there who needs it for a productive project or whatever the case may be, starting a business, etc. And so you need a capital market to be able to mediate that activity. And so how might we calculate something like that? Well, Nick goes into, from a first principle standpoint, the couple of components that would make that up. 
there's got to be some principal amount, some amount of money that you're either locking up or making available for a use that expressly makes it unavailable for other uses, right? So there's this principal amount, then there's some sort of cash flow, and then finally there's the time component. How long is this money being locked up? And if you think about the hash time lock contracts, which form the fundamental basis for how the Lightning Network operates, how payments get routed from point A to B to C to D. And by the way, if you're new to any of that, I have a whole playlist on the Lightning Network, starting from the very basics of how it all works. So I would invite you to check that out. But you can think about how those components map in the world of the Lightning Network. The principle is whatever amount of Bitcoin you're locking up in a particular channel with your channel partner, right? The cash flows are the routing fees that you may earn for routing payments on the Lightning Network using that capital that you've locked up, right? You're rendering a service that others are paying for. People are paying to have their payments sent from A to B on the network. And you're collecting that as a Lightning node routing those payments. And then of course there's time. So the time lock of hash time lock contracts is what helps us also get an understanding of time. So by using these sort of elementary components, we can start to compute and think about a reference rate or a risk-free rate of capital. And so there are in fact many such rates in the traditional finance world. There's things like the Fed funds rate, there's things like LIBOR or the London Interbank Offered Rate. This is basically, it's like a panel of banks that sort of say, hey, this is, this is my interest rate, this is my interest rate, and those rates get aggregated into what is called the LIBOR rate. And all a reference rate is, is the rate that everything else further along the risk curve should reference when pricing its own opportunity cost, cost of capital. And so as Nick goes through in the traditional world, you have got the US treasury yield, right? That is the kind of quote unquote risk-free rate. Uh, we know that it's not actually risk-free. There is risk of default. So make no mistake, that is definitely not risk-free, but market participants for whatever reason deem it to be the least risky, right? And so that makes it the reference rate. And so then if I'm a corporation and I want to issue debt to raise money for my operations, I would probably take the treasury yield and add on, you know, 100 basis points or 150 basis points or whatever it is. So there's that risk premium that's being added to the quote unquote risk-free rate. And similarly, if I'm an equity, right, you you're higher risk, higher reward, and so on and so on and so forth. And so the point here is that you need this reference rate not only to enable these additional markets within the system, but you also somewhat need that even to grow the system in the first place. If there's no sort of rate of return, you're just not going to get capital being allocated and thus the Lightning Network will sort of remain largely a hobbyist type of thing as opposed to the liquidity layer of a new financial system. And so Nick in the article goes through and posits a couple different ways that we might think about calculating this reference rate. Again, I will put that in the description down below for you to take a look at. But fast forward to June 2023 and we have just seen Amboss announce Liner. So they have unveiled their Liner Index and Liner or the Lightning Network rate measures Bitcoin returns on the Lightning Network that can serve as a benchmark interest rate for Bitcoin without credit risk. And so taking a step back for a moment, this is a humongous deal, right? The ability to earn a yield in a way in which you're exposed to no counterparty risk, that is unique. That is the first time in monetary history we have seen that. And I'm referring, of course, to the routing fees that I can get by participating as a Lightning node on the Lightning Network. Now, you may say, well, there could be like malicious channel closings. What if I have a peer that maliciously tries to, uh, you know, cheat the channel balance and I'm not watching it? You're right. I mean, there are some risks in that regard, but if you're properly running a lightning node in the way that you should be, and again, I've got a whole list of tutorials on how to do just that, this becomes a way to generate a return on your Bitcoin capital in a way in which you don't have to trust it to the Celsiuses of the world or whomever who's going to turn around and loan it to others 
who then turn around and loan it to others and you have this chain of rehypothecation that results in bad things. And so why is this sort of published index that now exists from Amboss so important? Well, think of an enterprise that might want to deploy capital to the Bitcoin ecosystem, but looks at all the blowups of the centralized finance players like Celsius, like others, and thinks to themselves, yeah, right. Like I'm just not going to allocate capital to this ecosystem when now they have a robust measure of a very, very low risk way to earn a return. Furthermore, this can provide insight to merchants who might be interested or considering accepting payments over the Lightning Network. And so Liner, as we see, has two components. There is the Liner cost. And so this is basically the annualized rate that you would pay for a Lightning channel. So this is akin to what a merchant would pay that you can then compare against what they pay for card payment fees. And then you also have the liner yield, which is sort of the opposite side. It's the annualized rate of return for allocating liquidity to the lightning network. And we can see the math for those specifically as follows. So let's take the liner cost here on the left. You can see that it's basically a weighted average and they're weighting it by capacity or the capacity of the different channels basically that are going into the calculation. And so you've got the annual percentage rate or APR as a capacity weighted average. And the APR, as we can see at the bottom, is being calculated as it follows. So again, this is what I pay in order to use a lightning channel, for example. So I would pay the fixed fee for the channel, which is B, plus the variable fee times the capacity of the channel. Again, I've talked about these different fee components in some of my prior videos. So I'll link those in the description down below. So, you know, the top side of this equation is basically what I'm paying, normalized for the time that I am paying it. And then this constant factor 52,560, I believe is probably the number of Bitcoin blocks in a year to make it annualized. And then similarly on the liner yield side, a capacity weighted average yield, and they're calculating the yield as the fees that the routing node is taking in adjusted for the channel opening and closing costs. That's very important, right? So it's taking into account the on-chain fees that are required to not only open the channel, but also close it and settle it to the main chain. So very, very cool stuff. And we can see a glimpse of the data here in this blog post. You can see the red line is the liner cost and the green line is the yield. And interestingly, you can see that the yield is indeed trended down a bit. That is largely due to the higher on-chain fees. If we break that apart a little bit, we can look at the liner cost. And so again, this can be a pretty good baseline for what a merchant might expect to pay in order to be able to accept uh, lightning payments. And you can see that actually this is still fairly elevated, right? People talk about like the three to 4% average that merchants pay for processing card payments. And so there are some points in time where this has been equal, if not elevated to that. Uh, but there have also been times where it's even below, you know, 2%. So it'll be interesting to see how this averages out over time and how different lightning payment service providers deal with and manage this in a way that allows them to offer even more favorable pricing to merchants. And then we can also get a glimpse of the liner yield. And then again, those big spikes down can partly be explained by the fact that the liner calculation assumes that the channel closing cost is equal to the channel opening cost. When in reality, we know that that is certainly not necessarily the case, right? Node operators can be strategic with when they close channels and time that with periods of lower uh, fee intensity. And so keep that in mind as a potential caveat. And the other caveat too is in terms of how they, you may ask how do they even populate or calculate this? I believe it is an opt-in on an opt-in basis for Amboss users. So if you're running a Lightning node, you can go over to Amboss uh, and create an account with them, and then presumably opt in to contributing data to this index. And of course, even there, there's some trade-offs, right? Well, as a Lightning Node operator, maybe I don't wanna share all my performance data you know, voluntarily with, with an entity who's kind of aggregating it in some way. So again, this is not perfect, none of this is perfect, but it does in that way resemble the panel-like method with which something like LIBOR is 
calculated and used today in the traditional financial system. And so it would be interesting to understand what proportion of total network activity is being represented by the index. I would suspect that now it's very, very small, but who knows how that will evolve over time. And indeed, you can see this chunky disclaimer that they add, which is sort of to that point. You know, this is not, you know, take this with a, a grain of salt, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to start somewhere. And so this is a very, very exciting development. And if you're not already, make sure you hit that subscribe button because I will be doing a follow-up video on Amboss's Magma Marketplace where if you're running a lightning node, you can buy or sell channel capacity in a marketplace. And that is how they are getting the data to calculate these indices. And so again, still early days for Liner, but I think this is a really, really incredible first step. And it really plays very nicely into what Roy Scheinfeld, who's the CEO of Breeze, Breeze started out as a Lightning wallet. It's fully non-custodial. They use some very, very clever tricks to make a highly usable non-custodial uh, Lightning wallet. I would encourage you to check out my tutorial that I did on Breeze. But they've now dramatically evolved to being both a Lightning service provider, meaning they offer all sorts of services like opening channels with you so that you have inbound liquidity to accept payments on the Lightning network. And then they're also doing this open LSP model where they are providing like LSP as a service, right? Their lightning as a service offering will give other entities the tools to become LSPs themselves. And so if I'm a smart capital allocator, but I don't necessarily have the lightning developer expertise, I can use Breeze's lightning SDK as my foundation for my tech stack. Now I would invite you to read this article from Roy as well. There are few out there who I think see the big picture of where Lightning is heading better than Roy. And he talks about this flywheel with things like the Breeze SDK, with things like Liner that publish what could be had in terms of return on capital, you therefore attract capital to the lightning network. The more capital you you attract to the lightning network, the more users you can support on the network. The more users you can support on the network, the more the fees accrue to the lightning service providers, the more fees accrue, the more capital is attracted, and so on and so forth. This is a critical flywheel for how the lightning network expands to be able to support everyone on earth. Now I know there's a whole line of other questioning around well, custodial versus non-custodial usage for everyone on earth to use the lightning network non-custodially would take decades in terms of on you know the on-chain transactions that would have to happen. And I get all of that. But the point is, first things first, like you need the liquidity. Lightning is fundamentally a liquidity network. And so that's the big picture with these emerging tools and data sets you're going to attract a lot more capital to be locked up in the Lightning Network, which will in turn support broader usage of the network. With all that though, let's go ahead and conclude today's video. So we talked about Amboss's release and unveiling of the Liner or Lightning Network rate, which is perhaps the very first risk-free rate for Bitcoin, and it also contributes to that growth and flywheel that we discussed. But I'm curious to hear, what are your thoughts? What do you think about this announcement? Are there other things you'd like to see covered on the channel? Again, be sure to subscribe if you aren't already because I'm gonna be doing the Magma tutorial and a number of related videos in the future. But I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, use the share feature underneath this video. And if you are so enamored with this content, you want to donate to a pleb, which really does help me continue to make these videos, you can do so in a number of ways. You can use the super thanks feature built directly into YouTube. Uh, if you're using something like, like the Get Albi Lightning browser extension, you can just open that and it'll automatically detect that you're on my channel and allow you to send some sats that way. Or I will have my Lightning address and strike account on the final page momentarily. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, every sack counts, but until next time, I'll see you then. Bye.